Um, I've kind of extended this research in, in recent times to kind of look at preferences in choice experiments both with a two-profile and a three-profile conjoint analysis. The hypothesis here that the three-profile uh, cards are actually more efficient in understanding um, the, the variation in preferences. This is well known in the marketing literature, but there's little experimental data to prove it. Um, so we're going to do a randomized control trial um, of here we're just going to focus them on the methods um, and focus on the hearing aid attributes that I've found in my previous work and put this in a national online survey. This is the traditional approach. We've kind of seen the progression of the science from my first little conjoint analysis. We're now using visual graphics and, and whatnot to explain the, the attributes uh, uh, um, to people. So the question is, do I do that or do I do that? And does it make a difference? Um, and when I do this, I'm also going to focus on not only just the first best, but also the second best. So I can actually rank those three ideas with the notion that more information should allow me to estimate uh, the values more accurately. Well, this is not actually the case. The accuracy is about the same. It's at the magnitude that changes. If we look here at the difference between the red bars, which is the paired experiments, and the blue bars, which is the fully ranked model, we kind of see, again, very different valuations um, of, of uh, the, these innovations. So we even get higher values for noisy settings and quiet settings and some lower valuations on some of the less value things. So the demarcation between these attribute levels when we use a more accurate model is not in terms of the accuracy in terms of our traditional notion of a variance because the variances stay pretty much the same. It's actually in the value that we attribute to this. How could we explain this? If I now look at the individual model, so this is the summation or the, the frequency of the individual parameter estimates, I get some strange peaks here. Um, we see here that a large number of respondents in the noisy setting, the, the kind of bottom uh, uh, um, right-hand graph there, we see this large peak at one. And what's happening here is that a, a lot of people are voting strategically in here. So we get a, a couple of peaks at one at noisy setting, and the others are kind of dominated by this peak at zero. Even the um, noisy setting has a peak at zero. This is not a very good distribution to draw from. If we look at the triplets, however, this phenomena of, uh, of strategic voting has disappeared. We get a much better distribution of the individual parameter estimates, a more consistent model. And because the zeros have disappeared, we actually get a better estimation of the valuation. So what does this mean? You know, a, a failure to value healthcare attributes appropriately is kind of distorting the incentives for innovation. Um, if we can find better methods to more accurately uh, 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 describe the innovations that we have, um, this could lead to a, a better argument for both in terms of the payment and reimbursement systems, but also in the regulatory frameworks and lead to a, a, a more scientific method for valuation of, of healthcare and healthcare interventions. And of course, as, as Steve said, um, more research is needed. So um, thank you. More research is needed, which of course means more money is needed. So it's, it's the uh, it's, uh, foregone conclusion, I think, is the, is the research term for that. Um, our, our next speaker is uh, Ezra F uh, Fishman from uh, Stanford University, who is filling in. I, th I think uh, one of the phenomena that we have uh, going on is that we have more research projects underway now uh, in, in health. Um, at, at one time than we've ever had before. And we are being much more active uh, in asking those researchers to speak at conferences such as this one. Um, and they, they simply can't be every place at all times. So uh, Stefano Zenios, who is the principal investigator of our grants at the uh, Stanford University, uh, was not able to attend today, although he wanted to be. Um, so I think, um, t correct me if I'm wrong, Ezra, you drew straws and you won? Is that the, the way it works? Ezra Fishman, who is a member of the, t of the research team on this project, uh, is here to fill us in. And the, um, the, uh, uh, the project at Stanford is a look at uh, the, the roles of clinicians in uh, medical uh, innovation. 
and uh, Ezra will be able to uh, fill us in on how that project is going and uh, also uh, t uh, draw, the, draw the dotted lines between that research and what it means for reimbursement and the payment community. Ezra? Thanks, Steve. We also uh, want to, again, thank InHealth for their generous support of this research. And uh, Stephanos wanted me to uh, personally apologize on his behalf for, for not being able to make it out here. Uh, this research project is a collaboration between Stanford Graduate School of Business um, and Wharton. Um, the co-investigators are Stefano Zenios and Professor Robert Burns, um, with support from Jason Franklin, a recent graduate, um, and myself, a current student. Um, I also have five years of experience in the startup device world, which is why Stefano said, well, we'll let you do it. Um, so just quick overview, I'm going to give a quick introduction of why we're doing this research, why it matters, um, our methodology, um, and then go to three outcomes. Uh, this is still early. Uh, we're one year into research, and it's an 18-month project. Um, but we have three outcomes, the first of which is a taxonomy describing physician con company collaborations. Uh, the second is a description of the determinants and types of compensation. And finally, the most interesting area, the potential for conflict of interest, including some talk about the recent legis legislation. So the first question is, does the role of the physician matter in, in startups and in the medical device community? Um, and our research, our discussion with members of the community um, proved that, yes, it is still a critical, critical role. Um, as Tom Fogarty said, the industry cannot do anything without physicians, and physicians could do very, very little without industry. Um, in our discussions, we found that the role of physicians um, covers all, all cycles of the innovation process, from the early needs finding to the development of technologies, the refining of technologies, performing clinical trials, um, and on to um, making changes to existing products. And a lot of our research was based on interview with interviews with members of the community, so we'll share some quotes throughout. Um, Tom Fogarty on, on the changes. Um, product development was easier than 20 or 30 years ago because there were far fewer rules and regulation governing what you could and couldn't do in the hospital. Um, Warren Watson, former executive of Medtronic, I believe one of the greatest risks in the nation today is the social political environment that is attempting to separate physicians from industry. So we'll talk about kind of this change and, and what's happening and what the future looks like. So the key, the two key questions that we're trying to address in our research and in this presentation, first is what are the various types of collaborations between physicians and companies? And second, what are the potential conflicts of interest that may arise because of these collaborations? And can we define this, uh, these conflicts um, in a systematic way? For our methodology, um, we started with a literature review, over 50 articles from startup and in vivo describing the relationship of physicians with companies, um, and then went on to qualitative interviews with 15 members of the medical device community. This ranged from entrepreneurs to venture capitalists to company executives um, and physicians as well. So the first outcome was a taxonomy trying to describe the various forms the relationship can take. Um, and we came up with, um, from our research, from uh, nine different categories to describe the role of physicians. Um, and these categories uh, develop, there's a, there's a differentiator whether the company is an early stage or later stage, with the distinction being generally uh, FDA approval. Um, there's two categories, board advisor and clinical investigator, that tend to span uh, those stages. And I'm going to go briefly describe these different categories. Uh, there is some overlap between the categories. Uh, for example, the inventor versus entrepreneur. The inventor, often the physician, has identified a need um, and has come up with a patent for technology. Um, and this physician may work with a team of engineers to develop it or may instead just license the technology um, to a company. The entrepreneur, in contrast to the inventor, um, actually joins the team, joins the company, and takes um, ownership of the business um, and development um, thereof. 